One of the most fascinating books in my personal library is The Pink Swastika, Homosexuality in the Nazi Party. You want to talk about a politically incorrect book? Well, this is it. The left-wing activists in the news media don't want you to know that the Nazi Party was officially the National Socialist Party. They weren't right-wingers. They were far left-wingers. And the socialists and their apologists in the news media also don't want you to know about how deeply the Nazi Party was infested with occultism and homosexuality, two things that appear before a nation implodes. Well, the Pink Swastika was published in 1995. I think I bought my first copy, oh, I'm thinking sometime maybe the year 2000. We started the program in 1999, so it was sometime in that period. And and it it was an eye opener for me, and I I remember, I remember clearly when when I, the Holy Spirit gave me a a reading list. It wasn't by the books, but it was by topics, and I was in prayer, and the and the Lord just gave me this list of topics that He wanted me to study, and one of them was Nazism. And and I wrote down the whole list that I that I was hearing in my spirit as I was praying. And I began to search for books on those subjects, and that's how I came across the pink swastika. And I was shocked at what I learned about Hitler and the top Nazis, and I said, they lied to me in school and college. They never told me any of this stuff. The media has never told me any of this. All they've told us is that they were right-wingers, and they weren't right-wingers. They were gay, left-wing socialists. I'll imagine that. Well, the book was co-authored by Dr. Scott Lively and Kevin Abrams. And Dr. Lively is on the telephone. He is a ardent defender of the traditional family, and his website is defendthefamily.com. Dr. Lively, welcome to True News. Oh, it's so very good to be here. I believed that the Nazis were anti-homosexual, and I... And I was the uh, spokesman for a ballot measure campaign in Oregon uh, when I encountered this information for the first time. Uh, we had uh, introduced a ballot measure that would have uh, changed the Oregon Constitution and stopped the homosexual agenda cold. And I was the spokesman for that, the communications director for the Oregon Citizens Alliance. And the opposition campaign was based on the theme that people who oppose gay rights are like the Nazis. And, uh, and that was... That we were hammered with that for two solid years. All the media, the governor, the, the, the activists that flooded in from all over the world to oppose us. And one day, this uh, this guy came into my office, uh, and uh, he was sort of a wild-eyed sort of a guy, and he had this sheet of of handwritten notes, and he said, "They got it all wrong. The Nazis were homosexuals." And and uh, and you know, I thought the guy was a kook, and. And, uh, you know, I nodded politely and took those papers and stuck them in a file, didn't really do anything. We went through that whole election cycle, and then in the next election cycle, we, we lost. We, we revived the campaign and uh, a whole series of city and county initiatives. And when we got to the Marion County where we were, the opposition leader brought, revived that campaign that, that to people who oppose gay rights or like the Nazis. And he wrote a letter to the local newspapers saying he just returned from Dachau. What an amazing similarity there was between the OCA and the Nazis. And I said, I've had enough. I went and dug up these papers out of my files, read them for the first time, and my jaw hit the desk. Because uh, these, were, these were direct quotations from mainstream history books, William Shirer, Conrad Hyden, and others, stuff that had been published from the 40s through the 60s. And uh, and that was the beginning of this of this book, and uh, I went out and did hundreds more hours of research and compiled and that's what's now 400 pages of documentation on this theme in the in uh, the Pig Swastika, which is now in its fourth edition. Okay, let's start with the Führer himself. Uh, did he have sexual identity problems? Well, Hitler was a what I would call a pansexualist. Uh, uh, he wasn't exclusively a homosexual, uh, not in the sense of just being attracted to people of the same sex. Uh, there are at least four women that we know of that he had sex with. 
It was all, it was a very perverted form of sexuality. All four of them tried to commit suicide, two of them succeeded. Uh, he, uh, his, it seems that his primary emphasis was a form of extreme form of masochism called coprophilia, which involves human excrements. Very, it's completely disgusting. And I think that the homosexual culture that he lived in and that homosexual relationship that he maintained with his whole inner circle was really sort of a, a, a less perverse identity than the one that he would have opted for if he'd had the chance. The person that's probably the closest to Hitler's profile in terms of sexual perversion is Alfred Kinsey, the guy that really launched the sexual revolution here in America. Mm -hmm. He was an in-the-closet gay activist, but he spent all of his time uh, in, indulging himself in every kind of wickedness that you can think of. And Hitler uh, did pretty much that as well, but uh, and, and, there's and, less and, opportunity there in, in, in Kin Germany. And Kinsey, Kinsey, in his experiments, he, he actually had children, little children, yeah. who were molested as part of his scientific experiments. Yes. Now, some of those were actually the children of uh, one of the, I think it was the Buchenwald concentration camp, and that the person who did those experiments, uh, many of them, was one of the Krupps, uh, who had a sort of a children's division of the concentration camp, and he messed with all those kids there. That, and people don't understand that the Kinsey Institute that exists today, they've got uh, the old German records. Is People don't know that the, that the gay movement did not start here in the United States. It started in Germany in the 1860s, and it came to full fruition as a movement uh, by the 1920s in Germany. It's, it was the reason for the, for the moral disintegration of that country and the rise of Nazism. And the, the whole inner circle of Adolf, Adolf Hitler uh, was homosexual. But this is where it gets really interesting, because Hitler's uh, uh, faction were masculine-oriented, you know, butch homosexual men. And the, the ones that the Nazis later did persecute, there were quite a number of them, nowhere near in the millions. It was, in the, it was maybe the tens of thousands. But uh, the, their enemies were the, the effeminate branch of the German gay subculture, which actually got started first. It was Karl Heinrich Ulrichs, the founder of the, feminine, uh, the feminist branch of the, of the male gay movement, uh, that really launched the whole thing. It's, it's one of his friends that coined the term homosexual. It didn't exist before Ulrich's group. And he created a group called the Scientific Humanitarian Committee uh, in order to try to create a political movement to overturn the sodomy laws of Germany. And, uh, but he had a theory that, that uh, um, all male homosexuals were really females trapped in men's bodies and lesbians were really men trapped in female bodies. And, uh, and then he called that the third sex theory. So what he was basically saying is that all homosexual men are really women, and the masculine-oriented butch homosexuals hated this guy because they were not feminine at all. They were even ultra-masculine, and so they warred. These two factions warred against each other for a long time. Uh, and then the, when the Nazis really formed together and, and wanted to, to pursue political control of the state, they, they created the Nazi party, and it, the, almost all the early Nazis were homosexual, almost all of them, and, uh, and they began going for parliamentary seats. Well, the effeminate homosexuals were aligned with the Communist Party, and there they were, uh, the, 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 the homosexuals among the communists were, were grounded in the Sex Research Institute of Berlin, which was Germany's version of the Kinsey Institute, and uh, and by this time, Ulrichs was long dead. Magnus Hirschfeld was the head of this Sex Research Institute of Berlin, which everybody that got arrested for sex crimes was sent to this institute for therapy, right, which was, which was being run by these effeminate homosexual men. And so uh, what would happen, though, is that these, these uh, effeminate gays affiliated with the communists, whenever there was an election and the Nazis were trying to get parliamentary seats, they would release information to the newspapers about the homosexuality of the Nazis and sabotage them. So they had this intense hatred uh, of, the, of the femmes. And so as, as soon as Hitler came to power, 
1933, one of the first acts of his of his control was to send the, the brown shirts over uh, and to to uh, to take over the Sex Research Institute of Berlin, to to go in there, take control of the building, kick everybody out, steal all those files, which was all the incriminating evidence. That was May 6, 1933. Four days later, May 10, 1933, was they put them all in a big giant bonfire and set it on fire. And then they were stood out there throwing cult, you know, you know, Thomas Mann's books and other things in there to make it look like it was something else. But that that famous image of the burning of the book burning, mm -hmm. uh, that was the records of the Sex Research Institute of Berlin. And it was the it was the assistant director of the institute that exposed the, that, that came out publicly saying the reason they're doing this is because that's all the records that show that these guys were arrested for perversion. But they it's just it's but amazing they, stuff. They threw books in as the political cover for the giant fire. Right, right. You know, and, and, and today, to, today, the only thing <laughs> teachers and professors talk about in school and colleges is the Nazis burned books. Yes, that's that's it. It's it's amazing, amazing deception that they engaged in in this, and and almost nobody knows this stuff. Well, th this explains uh, why Hitler and the Nazis were going after the communists because. Yes. All right. Hitler, well, I mean, Hitler well, was a socialist, so why would he yeah. why would he go to war with the communists? Well, you know, they called the brown shirts uh, beefsteak, brown on the outside, red on the inside. You know, and they actually copied uh, the Nazis really copied the communists in many of their tactics. It was the communists that were doing the sort of, you know, beating people up and stuff for a long time. You know, the Bolsheviks uh, had, you know, and that's how they had taken over Russia. In fact, the first concentration camps weren't in Germany. They were in Russia. And the Nazis are basically just following the example of the model that had been set. So they were just, they were just a, a, a counterfaction. They were a splinter off of the communists. Hitler, as a young man, he was a student of uh, Madame Blavatsky. Uh, he was right. deeply involved in the occult. All this happened when he, when he got in. When he was a street kid, basically. Mm -hmm. He left his home. He didn't have any place to go. He was on the streets in Germany, in mostly in, in Munich and Vienna, uh, and uh, and he was as a, as a street kid with no place to go. He was you know trying to make it as an artist, and that was the perfect recipe to sort of be swept up into gay culture. And uh, I don't know who introduced him. That isn't you know he never confessed to any of this stuff or wrote about it himself. It's all sort of uh, secondary evidence and other sources. People who are saying that they had sex with Hitler or whatever. But what we do know is. That he became a male prostitute in Munich and Vienna. Hitler, and lived, Hitler was a yeah. male prostitute. Yes, and he and he lived in a flop house for uh, you know that was primarily a home for street hustlers, and uh, and that's how he met many of these people, including Ernst Röhm, who was really the power behind the throne uh, in uh, in Germany. What took okay. place in the twenties and early thirties? Well, uh, you really the beginning of the of the of the Butch faction was in 1902. Uh, a uh, Hans Bluer uh, formed the Gemeinschaft der Eigenen, uh, the community of the elite, and they were they were sort of chafing against this characterization uh, of male homosexuals as women, and so they created the separate identity. They reached back to ancient Greek culture, specifically the Spartans. For a sort of model to follow, and then they began promoting this sort of hyper masculine form of homosexuality throughout Germany. They gained control of the, of the German uh, von der Vogel movement, which is like the German version of the Boy Scouts. And, uh, and by 1912, they were in complete control of that. But that's and what they're doing here, Doctor Lively. That's what yeah. they're doing in America. They're t they're they're infiltrating the Boy Scouts. Yeah, that's well, they're trying to. They've been they've resisted it pretty much here, but in Germany. They were completely taken over. In fact, a group had to split off away from them in order to have a separate form of Boy Scouts that wasn't under homosexual control. But the real, the real important fact here is that what they were doing was in, inculcating in these children the, the philosophy of the Mannerbund, the all-male society. That's where it was in the Vogel that, that their greeting that they had was the Sieg Heil salute. 
You know, this wasn't invented later by the Nazis. This came out of that of that homosexual pederast culture uh, in the early teens. And actually, that the whole the concept of the Führer also the Führer is is, almost, is it's not just, it doesn't just mean leader. It means it's like the it's like a religious figure that deserves all respect. And that concept of Führer came out of that same group as well. And uh, it had huge, huge influence. We don't know if Hitler was a member or not, but it, 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 uh, you know, he clearly was steeped in that same way of thinking. Now, it's these young men that actually came of age just in time to fight in World War I, and they were the ones that really became what was known as the, as the, the stormtroopers. And they, they called them that because they would sort of jump up out of the trenches on their side, and in this lightning strike, they would storm across the battlefield and jump into the trenches of the enemy, the Allies, uh, in these daring raids. And uh, because they had this sort of warrior ethos that they had adopted based on the Spartan model. And, uh, and it was these, these young men that really became known as the stormtroopers. And, they were, and, and it, really, it really starts to take shape in terms and look like what we would recognize today as Nazis. Uh, at the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles is imposed on Germany. It can only have 100,000 men in arms. So the nationalists all organize, keep their guys all organized in these, in these non-military uh, hierarchical structures, sports teams and things like that, that were called Freikorps or Free Corps. Uh, and they were all organized under the leadership of the former junior officers of the army. Well, one of those Freikorps was called the Rosbach Bund. It was Gerhard Rosbach's group. That's what that means, the Rosbach Bund, Ger Gerhard Rosbach's group. And Rosbach was the, was the main homosexual leader uh, um, leading into the creation of the Nazi party. He was the guy who invented the brown shirts. Uh, that's his, his group, his Freikorps were all homosexual and they were distinct from all the other Fry Corps because he dressed his guys in brown uniforms that were left over. So he got them out of the army surplus stores because Germany had lost its African colonies during World War I. And so all these brown uniforms that were now filling up these stores because they no longer owned any of these territories. And that's the, that's the color that they used in Africa. The rest of the Fry Corps were still dressed in the gray uniforms of the German army. And so Rosbach was distinct from all the rest in dressing his guys in brown, and that's how they became known as the brown shirts. And so all the brown shirts at the beginning were homosexual. Whoa. You're saying all of the Nazi brown shirts at the beginning were homosexual. That's a strong yeah. statement. Well, it's, I mean, you, you, I mean that's, that's the part that even the left will admit. I mean, that's not, that's not as, as uh, cryptic. Uh, and, and hidden as some of the rest of the information. I mean, there's lots of there's lots of historians that acknowledge that. Um, it's when you, it's, the, it's some of the other stuff that that uh, that they will you know, like Ernst Rome, for example. They can't deny that he was a homosexual because he was in the newspapers. They've got newspaper clippings of him being tried, put on trial for uh, for molesting boys and things. Uh, and uh, but uh, Rosbach was himself molested, or at least recruited, into homosexuality by Gerhard Rosbach. And then he took over for Rosbach as the head of the brown shirts. And right at the time that, that Hitler and Rome were becoming partners in this sort of campaign to create a political movement. I'm talking with Dr. Uh, Scott Lively in the book, uh, The Pink Swastika. Uh, homosexuality in the Nazi Party. It was uh, published in 1995. I've had a copy of it for years. Uh, the book is available. It's out there on what in a fourth uh, edition now. Fourth edition. Actually, I'd send people to World Net Daily. That's the uh, they're ca carrying the book now. I'd rather support them than Amazon. Okay. And and uh, or you can go through my website, defendthefamily.com. You can get it directly from me. Yeah. Okay. Defendthefamily.com. Yeah, so support his ministry, defendthefamily.com. Um, okay, was did the Nazis uh, did they did they seek to introduce homosexual um, 
themes into German society through propaganda in the schools and other uh, parts of the society? The the thing about it is that um, Hitler knew that he would never get away with being open about his homosexuality. What happened was that the homosexual movement had come to full power by the 20s. And it was really the effeminate branch of the movement that was associated with homosexuality. And they had corrupted Germany so severely that by during the Weimar period, just before the Nazis, they had what we sort of what we have under Obama, an extreme socialist theme and a disintegration of sexual morality, uh, even worse than here today. And they had like huge in the cities, they had huge transvestite balls with, with men dressed as women and women dressed as men. They had teams of prostitutes wandering the street that included mothers and daughters and fathers and sons. Just every type of perverse taste that you had could be satisfied almost openly. And that was what the, that was what the German people were rebelling against. The people didn't like this. And, and, and they wanted to return to some, to, to what would seem to be a more conservative morality. And that's what Hitler came in saying that he would do. That he had very carefully protected the impression that he was um, against the homosexuals. This is really, In fact, this is, I mean, this is a, this so is a bizarre. mind, this is a, a mind bender. You got to think yeah. about this. Hitler and his inner circle were gay, but the German public was rebelling against the open, effeminate homosexuality that was rampant in their society. And they ended up embracing a secret in the closet yeah. homosexual who then brought in the worst fascism, the worst totalitarian, totalitarian dictatorship that Germany had ever seen. Okay, now, Dr. So Lang, got- I, I've been saying for many, many years that that the United States of America right now resembles Germany in the 30s. And I, I believe we are on the same path. And I'd say we're in the twenties. I'd say we're. I'd say we're in the twenties now. So we're in the. Tw- okay. So you you think we're on the same path, but maybe uh, we're a decade back. We're in the twenties. We're at the point. Yeah. We're at the point we're, of the we're open. Weimar. Okay. We're, we're the Weimar culture of where Obama is is working to bring in so, uh, a socialist system. You know that's what the whole healthcare thing is and all that. The Nazis didn't embrace that kind of stuff. They were industrialists, you know. They had they kept control and ownership of the industries, but they were like they were real big on industry and people working and and all of that. Uh, the the Weimar culture is is very much like what we have. What the Democrat Party today is very much like the Weimar culture was then, very extremely socialistic and amoral or or, or immoral to an extreme. Every kind of perversion is acceptable. Uh, no limitations on that, indoctrinating uh, the, the whole society in uh, in anything goes kind of sexual morality. That's different. When Hitler came along, him and his cronies were homosexual, and they were doing all their stuff in the back rooms. But on the surface, they were the moralists. And what I think what we're seeing is the is all the groundwork being laid for a globalist system to to come in. You know, what, who is the Antichrist? As, as he's described in uh, Revelation, the Antichrist is a, is a man of incredible power and deception that seems to be coming in to sort of bring order. Uh, I think that uh, the entire Bible can be viewed as prophecy, uh, not just the books of the prophets, that there are, uh, that, that everything within the Bible is multidimensional. Uh, but what I think the message that we're given regarding the end times is, is in the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It happens right after the, the destruction of the earth by water, by the flood. And, and it and is it said that by Jesus, that as in the days of Noah, so it will be when he comes for his second coming. So he's actually, he is connecting the end times to the flood. And so there's, there's, a, there's a big uh, parallel between what happens there and what happens here. So then he puts the rainbow up in the sky after the flood as a sign that he'll never destroy the earth again with water. Uh, and we know that forever after, 
fire then is the symbol of his wrath. Well, what happens right after the flood? You know, you read just a couple of pages or just a, just a couple of paragraphs even, uh, it's a very short distance from the end of the flood to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by fire. The only place in all of Scripture where an entire collection of four cities completely destroyed by fire and brimstone. Why? Because of homosexual perversion. They're basically begin doing again what they had done before the flood. And this time God is basically showing, okay, this is what's going to happen at the end. When, when, when I bring judgment by fire, here is the example. And Jude, in the book of Jude, I think, was it, 7, uh, verse 7, talks about that, that Sodom was destroyed for, because they went after strange flesh. And it's left there as an example forever of what happens to those who uh, reject God, that, that, that receive his wrath. Well, it also points out, uh, it's, it's also significant, what is the symbol of the gay movement today? It's the rainbow flag. Why? Of all things that they could choose. I believe, in a spiritual sense, that this is, this is them thumbing their nose at God. They're holding up the flag that represents God's promise not to destroy the earth. But at the same time, they deny that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is his action against homosexuality. So they completely miss that part of the story and are walking around under the banner of gay pride, pride in their sin. In Revelation, when it talks about the two witnesses, you know, after Satan kills, or Satan in inhabiting the Antichrist kills the two witnesses, they lie in the street for three days, no one's allowed to bury them, in the city that is called mystically Sodom and Egypt, which is it's the city of Jerusalem. Yes. But it's called mystically Sodom and Egypt. Now, why would that be? I believe that, that uh, I believe not only is that, is homosexuality central to that whole story, I think that may even be uh, wrapped up in the whole mark of the beast, uh, that, uh, that that something about, uh, about taking that mark represents a complete repudiation of Christ. And if it is, as I think it's going to be, and I, I think the scenario we're seeing, we're seeing it unfolding before us right now, right before our eyes. I think we're going to see a, a collapse of the global economic system. We're going to see worldwide chaos and, and millions of people dying. Uh, and then I think we're going to see the Antichrist come in as a savior, being hailed as a savior, and then he's going to bring with him a new global economic system in which you can only participate if you accept the mark, a number or whatever, that allows you to be able to go down to the, to the, to the uh, supply house and get your rations that otherwise you're not going to be able to get. And it's something about that. You have to sign a pledge or you have to some, something that uh, – and I, I think that, that there's going to be a homosexual element in that somehow. It's just a, it's just a hunch. Uh, but uh, just the, I see this as so central uh, to the whole story, and that, that homosexuality is presented in Scripture as being the ex as the outside edge, the extreme edge of rebellion against God that receives that, that's that's present when God uh, exhibits His anger. The anyway. book, the book is the pink swastika homosexuality in the Nazi Party. Uh, co-authored uh, by Dr. Scott Lively and uh, Kevin Abrams, and you can you can order your copy at Dr. Lively's uh, website, defendthefamily.com. Defendthefamily.com. Thank you, Dr. Lively. Appreciate you coming on the program today. Oh, it's my great pleasure. God bless you. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is True News.